we have to make a, a plan for 30 years to make it worthwhile. And we can barely make a decision uh, two quarters from now. So, you know, so essentially, the things you've described is why I wrote the book. So my timeline literally goes from the end of the Great Recession through where we are today. All of these disruptions have created what I identify as an era of chronic uncertainty. You're a business executive and you and, and thousands of other business executives are trying to make long-term business decisions. But at the same point, you don't have any direct control over the external business environment. Uh, so what was interesting to me in my book, I wrote five case studies, Joe, and I had interviewed a lot of different industries and I narrowed it down to these five. And these industry executives made a deliberate decision to build these industry trade association strategic partnerships to have better control of the external environment because they acknowledge that era of chronic uncertainty. Every day, it seemed like the next shoe was going to drop. Right. Are we ever going to run out of shoes? Welcome to A State of Readiness, a podcast set as a fireside chat with business leaders to discuss what it takes for a company to be in a state of readiness and become a higher performance organization with your host, Joseph Paris. Hello, and welcome to another edition of State of Readiness. I'm your host, Joseph Paris. Today, my guest is Daniel Veroni, President and CEO of Potomac Core, a consultancy specializing in helping trade associations transform into strategic partners for industries and professions. I first met Dan in New York City when he was the President and CEO of the Association for Corporate Growth, an organization dedicated to supporting the mergers and acquisitions ecosystem. We subsequently found ourselves on a panel discussion on business and economics at an unconference in Saratoga hosted by David Deutsch and his company, a strategic financial advisor of leading closely held companies. Dan has recently launched a book entitled Reimagining Industry Growth, which offers readers a blueprint for harnessing the power of leading industry associations as strategic partners. Hello, Dan. Welcome to my podcast. How are you doing today? Hello, Joe. I am thrilled to be at your podcast. And I'm doing great. How are you? Not so bad. Not so bad. You know, we've known each other for for a long, long time. I I would say I would years. put it. I, yeah, I, I think it's a little bit further than that. I don't know when you're president of ACG New York, uh, but that's when we met um, because David Deutsch, uh, a friend of both of ours, um, said, "Joe, you got to you, know, you got to visit this group." And, um, you know, I met so many great characters there. Some of them were real characters, you know. Actually, I was president of ACG Global, but I was probably visiting the chapter. Oh, really? I didn't know. I thought you were the chapter uh -huh. guy. You know, you're yeah. ACG Global. Yeah, so, back in the know, day. Well, I'll tell you, it was a great group. And, you know, I, I hold all other groups to that standard, you know, yes. because they really, especially the New York chapter. I mean, the New York chapter you know, is very, very vibrant. But, uh, and then you and I went and uh, uh, separately, of course, but at the same event to uh, David's uh, Camp David uh, weekend up in, uh, in Saratoga. It was a remarkable experience. And I talk about a group of nice people, clearly a, a bunch of people from ACG New York, uh, but just a captivating bunch of few days, really smart people, people thinking way outside the box. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I, I didn't tell too many people this because it doesn't really matter too much, but David actually was transformative in my business. He didn't know it and he probably still doesn't know it, mm -hmm. but uh, I got a little postcard inviting me to his weekend and the theme was grow or go. And at that point, at that very point in my, my career, I was very frustrated. I was stuck in the mud, just spinning my tires and, and the grow or go theme resonated with me. So I went, and at the conclusion of that, I decided I have to grow. I'm not ready to go. I'm, I have to grow. But it, it made me make a choice. Mm -hmm. You know, I couldn't stay in the mud anymore. And then a couple of years later, you and I were on a panel uh, together. Yes. Yeah, great, great time. So, so uh, now you're down in uh, the greater D.C. area, and you founded a company called Potomac Core. Yes. So tell me about it. You know, what was interesting, uh, I had a marvelous career as a trade association executive, Joe, and I saw that at the end of the Great Recession, 
that things had really changed. And um, I was always about building partnerships, but I said, in order to do that, I really need to understand the state of play uh, and how I might help trade associations uh, better connect, better align uh, with the industries that they were serving. Uh, so I took a year or two, uh, interviewed a lot of uh, trade association executives. Um, I had known a number of industry executives while I was a trade association exec. And uh, what I learned is that the world was far different, that industries were going to be making new decisions. And they were thinking about how they were going to spend their time and money. And uh, there was a new value imperative. So what I did is I said, I was going to create a consultancy. I was going to base it here in the Washington, D.C. area, because this is the U.S. capital of trade associations, the lion's share of them here in this area. Uh, I said the consultancy would be research-based uh, and that we would build industry-based uh, strategic partnerships. So building partnerships between industries and trade associations. Started it, uh, co-authored a book on strategic member engagement, uh, and then uh, a few years ago decided that I would write a new book, or write a book, a hardcover book called Reimagining Industry Growth on the Basis of What I'd Learned. So if you can imagine, Joe, like in your business, over time you meet a lot of people. Uh, I had interviewed over 2,000 industry executives uh, in my consultancy, and then interviewed another 24 executives, industry executives for my book. So I wrote this book. Uh, so I've been busy uh, consulting with my research team and writing the book, uh, writing a, a number of op-ed articles since, doing a lot of podcasts like this, a number of TV interviews. And it's just been a fascinating 11 years. My company is 11 years old this week. Congratulations. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank That's you. awesome. So um, <clears throat> trade associations, you know, I'm thinking about like, uh, you know, the reason that they're in D.C. is they also extend as a, a lobbying arm for the trades, right, yes. for oil and gas and, and yes. the pharma. OK, so that, that would all make sense. Um, in your, you know, now reimagining uh, industry growth, uh, you know, let's talk about industry in the United States, business in the, in the United States. Um, you know, it's, it's over, the, I'll tell you what, over the last, uh, you know, several years, a few years, you know, it's been um, a hell of a roller coaster ride. I mean, think about it, you know, just since uh, the time Trump was elected, okay, President Trump was elected. You think about, you know, the tariffs, the tariff war, you know, that, that, uh, that started, you think about the border challenges, you think about, can't forget about COVID, uh, you can't forget about Brexit, okay, that happened in that, uh, you can't forget about Ukraine being invaded by Russia, and I'm probably leaving off a couple, oh, the supply chain challenges and inflation, okay, yes. I mean, all that happened in the last six years, Okay, I mean, what's a, what's a business to do? I mean, you know, we're making plans for 30 years. We're going to put a plant down, you know what I mean? Put a foundation in and outfit it. We have to make a, a plan for 30 years to make it worthwhile. And we can barely make a decision uh, two quarters from now. So, you know, so essentially, the things you've described is why I wrote the book. So my timeline literally goes from the end of the Great Recession through where we are today. All of these disruptions have created what I identify as an era of chronic uncertainty. You're a business executive and you and, and thousands of other business executives are trying to make long-term business decisions. But at the same point, you don't have any direct control over the external business environment. Uh, so what was interesting to me in my book, I wrote five case studies, Joe, and I had interviewed a lot of different industries and I narrowed it down to these five. And these industry executives made a deliberate decision to build these industry trade association strategic partnerships to have better control of the external environment because they acknowledged that era of chronic uncertainty. Every day, it seemed like the next shoe was gonna drop. Right? Are we ever gonna run out of shoes? Yeah. Uh, and are they ever gonna stop dropping? Because every day there's something new and there's something different. 
So when we talk about controlling the external environment, we're talking about those pre-competitive regulatory and legislative issues, everything from, from taxes to trade policy, uh, to environmental policy, to regulatory policy, the types of things that govern the way in which businesses operate. And what these strategic partnerships do is absolutely fascinating. The trade association literally becomes the tip of the spear. They work to activate the industry ecosystem, which by the way, is the industry supply chain. And they get the companies within the supply chain to, to come to a common understanding. It's what I call a rising tide that lifts all boats strategies. What helps one of us helps all of us. What hurts one of us hurts all of us. And they all buy into this common principle so that if there, there are uh, regulatory initiatives or legislative proposals that are going to impede or help an industry, this industry builds strategies through their trade association to make very compelling cases as to why things should happen or why things shouldn't happen. So case in point, in my book, I write in the first case study about the recreational boating industry. Uh, and uh, they are part of an ecosystem called the outdoor recreation uh, ecosystem. What's compelling about this ecosystem is uh, they have themselves recognized as a key driver of the US economy. Uh, they had legislation introduced when Barack Obama was president of the United States. And uh, he signed that legislation after both houses of Congress passed it. And this legislation recognized outdoor recreation as a 2.1% contributor to the US economy. The US economy is $20 trillion, 2.1% is a key driver of the US economy. Anytime the outdoor recreation industry ecosystem makes a case, they say we represent 2.1% of the US economy. That's extremely powerful. Regardless of the party in power, we said again, regardless of the party in power, they've got the ability to shape legislation and regulations in a way that's positive for the outdoor recreation ecosystem. Uh, another example of how these ecosystems work. So we all remember when we went into lockdown and COVID, uh, I was uh, interviewing at that point, the chair of the National Marine Manufacturers Association, who's president of a major boating brand. And he said, Dan, we're really worried that the industry is gonna be in serious trouble here. We're gonna lay a lot of people off. So through their ecosystem, the National Marine Manufacturers Association and the Recreational Boating and Fishing Foundation uh, pulled together a digital ad campaign to engage people that were looking for ways to get out of the house safely. So they created this campaign and they drove boat sales to record levels, double digit levels, levels by which, by the way, the industry never expected after the end of the Great Recession. But these are just some examples of strategic partnerships and, and how well they work. Uh, another quick example would be the frozen food industry. So we all remember growing up on, uh, on burgers, fries, and pizza, except now frozen food, you can get absolutely every type of cuisine. And what their industry's strategic partner did, the American Frozen Food Institute, is they created research uh, and they, that organization partnered with the Retailer Trade Association, the Food Marketing Institute. And they identified the frozen food preferences of consumers they shared that research with the retailers and then the retailers stocked those frozen foods and it was a contributing factor in frozen foods taking off and achieving double digit growth. These are just two of numerous examples of how these industry trade association partnerships can create a level of certainty in an era of chronic uncertainty. Now, isn't it, uh, I seem to recall, um, the higher end yacht biz industry being decimated when uh, there was a tax passed on higher end yachts. You know, basically everybody stopped making them in the States and they're all made someplace else. Um, so that didn't quite work out as, as anticipated, I think for the, for the government, but uh, 
you know, uh, and you mentioned frozen foods. And every time you mention somebody mentions frozen foods in the States, I had this thing of chicken pot pies. I don't know if you ever, you know, I remember them. The honest Swanson, to God, the Swanson. Yeah, Swanson. Bar, yeah. Bar, yes. you know what? I, yes. I have a hankering for one every time somebody mentions from yes. the States frozen food. Um, so damn it. I'm now, gonna did have you to like have the chicken here. ones or the turkey ones? Because they I have... like the chicken ones. Yeah, I like the chicken ones better. So <laughs> crazy, crazy. But you know, industry needs advocacies uh you know to to you know highlight you know how important they are to commerce and, and to business and to to the economic viability of the united states uh you know without them you know we would be nothing and but at the same time you know they you know the people in you know that, that pull the strings that make the laws i don't think they think things all the way through most of the time like you know the whole ev stuff um, you know, I don't know what your opinion is on that, but I'll ask it in a moment, but I'll tell you where I'm at. Um, I have a, a big contract, uh, with work, uh, with workforce development. Um, and it's because, uh, uh, one of my clients got a gigantic grant to outfit their fleet of buses with EV buses. Hmm. All right. So it caused me to start researching the whole industry. And I, I've spoken uh, with uh, some people in, in government in Canada that are also doing this. Uh, and we're not prepared for it. Mm -hmm. We're not. We're, I mean, if if all of a sudden the, all these people got their buses, got their cars and everything else, there's woefully inadequate uh, charging stations in, in, in numbers alone. Not to mention, I saw an NPR um uh special on evs and the person was just driving a driving from uh, la to sacramento and you know he had to charge his car for 75 minutes could yeah. you imagine i mean my head would explode off my shoulders if i had to sit there and wait 75 minutes to recharge my car and they're always hunting for them now maybe maybe they'll uh, not have to hunt as much as more charging stations come online but if you think about buses the bus routes go from usually city center or something like that, uh, or from one extreme of the city to the other extreme of the city. Uh, and then they park, usually in some desolate, uh, desolate place before they turn around for the return trip. You know what I mean? Now, you and I know how Americans are, especially in rural, rural areas where uh, like nobody's around with these uh, turnarounds. You know yeah. the darn thing is going to get shot up. It's going to get vandalized. It's going yeah. to get stolen for the copper that's inside. All yes. right. So these bus charging stations are not going to be able to be at the extremes uh, that are uh, unattended, otherwise unattended. And, you know, just the grid, you know, if, if, in 2030, the grid, the line, the, the lines are going to just melt off of the off of the poles. There's not enough capacity in the grid as it exists to carry the voltage, to carry the power necessary to do it. So I'm thinking that, in my opinion, is that uh, the asset deployment far exceeds the ability to service them and support them, uh, and you know, maybe solid state batteries will make it so that we can get down to a charging of five minutes or 10 minutes, which is, which is, you know, tolerable, not too much different than a, a gas fill up, but 75 minutes, no way. So what, what are you, where do you see the whole EV going and you know, in general, and then maybe uh, American industry as a whole, because you know, you're knee deep into it. So let's take a step back and, and say, what's the outcome we're looking to achieve? And if you look at it generationally from Gen Z to millennial, there's a strong desire to reduce the carbon footprint. So if that's the case, what are the strategies that we need to develop and follow to reduce the carbon footprint? So currently, uh, and I'm doing a white paper on fuels, so your question is, is Perfect. Your timing is perfect. So what's interesting to me is that if that's the outcome, let's first look at where we are. Let's understand where we are. First, uh, gasoline has, is burning at a reduced carbon footprint. The uh, oil industry has uh, done a, uh, a very good job in reducing the carbon footprint. The second part of that is they can do an even better job in further reducing the carbon footprint. So let's say that. 
the other thing that we need to say is that here in the United States, we are the most innovative, most productive economy in the world. And we are because of our innovative and, and entrepreneurial capacity. So what we want to do is we want to unleash that. We want to unleash all of it around solutions to further reduce the uh, carbon footprint. So if that's the case, what I'm going to be proposing in my white paper is that all of the fuels industries, right? There's multiple industries from natural gas, biomass, electric, nuclear, so on and so forth, come together and they form their own ecosystem. And they say, what pre-competitive solutions do we agree upon? And then what is it that we need to do in order to build a 25-year roadmap that gives all of us the capability to deliver numerous and multiple forms of energy 25 years from now. And I'm saying this for a reason because there's a reality here. The reality is, first, you're correct. The infrastructure doesn't exist today to electrify the economy. Secondly, there are other fuel sources, example, uh, like hydrogen uh, and hydrogen cells that's currently being developed that could operate in engines for buses and cars that could have a much reduced carbon footprint. Uh, and we have to be thinking about it bigger. Ultimately, what I think about when I think about all these big challenges is because of chronic uncertainty, we have the opportunity to reimagine everything. None of us should be backed into a corner or operate inside a box that we need to be looking at all of the opportunities. It's not one solution, it's multiple solutions. And the more we look at it in that way, the more all aspects of the fuels industry come together in an ecosystem and develop pre-competitive solutions and build that 24-year roadmap, the better it's going to be. So it doesn't make sense usually for the government to say, we think this is the solution, makes best sense for industries, plural, to be incentivized on their own to develop and devise what they believe to be the next best solution. You know, it's uh, interesting. Uh, you know, one of the chapters in my book is entitled, uh, The Stone Age Didn't End Because They Ran Out of Stones. <laughs> all right. So, you, but almost always, it's an industry outsider. That right. is the person that transforms the industry. You think about, I think it was Fulton in the steam uh, steamboat. Right. Uh, you think about uh, Elon Musk. I mean, how transformative he's been in every industry he's touched. I mean, EVs, electric vehicles, would not be anywhere near where they are today without him. The right. space program, it costs, what, $4 billion to send Artemis around the moon? $4 billion. And here, you know, he's doing it for millions of dollars. Uh, you know, to give a perspective, I, uh, I, I came across NASA's CI program, Continuous Improvement Program. Yeah. And there was a, a, a PowerPoint that they did. And doing some math, I came up with uh, their um, uh, CI program, saving $17 million a year, each yeah. year for four years. Sure. Okay, $17 million a year. OK, and the person that was sharing the, the presentation was, you know, very enthusiastic about this savings. Yeah. But the reality is that NASA's budget's eighteen point seven billion dollars. Right. So if we take 17 million seconds, it's yeah. roughly a half a year. If we take eighteen point seven billion seconds, it's roughly five hundred and fifty years. Right. So, you know, these these outsiders are the ones I believe are going to, to transform the industry. You mentioned uh, hydrogen. You know, for my going back to my high school days, I knew that it took a lot of energy to break water into oxygen and hydrogen. You know what I mean? I mean, it just took a, an awful lot. Yeah. So I'm wondering, have they figured out a cheaper way of, of breaking these, these atoms apart? I don't know. And you can't have a conversation without nuclear being part of it. So nuclear uh, must be part of it. So here's what's interesting when you talk about nuclear. So here in the States, Joe, when you and I are growing up, uh, there's Three Mile Island and so on right. and so forth. Uh, nuclear is 
come a long way. The reactors are far smaller. Uh, transmission is a lot safer. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, it has a very low, non-existent carbon footprint. Right. So nuclear is a serious solution. And by the way, when you look at nuclear submarines, when have you heard about a nuclear? And how many weeks and months go on uh, these things are functioning independent of, uh, of a wired power source. Right. So nuclear is a serious and viable solution that must be on the table. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's France that gets 80% of its electricity from nuclear reactors, you know, and, you know, here, here in Germany, uh, Merkel shut them all down. I mean, you know, when was the last time you heard about an earthquake in Germany or God forbid a tidal wave in Germany? It just doesn't happen, you know, um, and I think that that is probably the single biggest risk is policy making from governments that have no no clue what, of the subject matter which they're regulating. You know what's what's interesting to me. Uh, you know, as a I was a former local elected official for 21 years when we lived in Illinois, and more things that I did is I always assumed that I didn't know anything. So um, I would invite. Uh, people in uh, to share their perspectives and what they thought and learn about what they knew. I think that elected officials think they're the experts when they need to be the students. I think that regulators think they're the experts when they need to be the students. So when you bring in the best brains in the world uh, and or the country and you look at yourself as a student, you've got an opportunity to build a collaboration that ultimately can be a win-win. Uh, one of the things that concerns me nowadays is that people tend to put themselves in a corner or build a box around themselves and, and they lose the forest for the trees. And it's very, it's highly limiting. Uh, I, was, I was talking to uh, some people last week and, and I just said, you know, any of us who think uh, that there's nothing better we can do. There's nothing new to learn. There's no new horizons to conquer in front of us. Then we're finished. And I'm excited. I'm energized every day because I'm always about reimagining something different and something new. And, and I think that's a missing piece here in the United States and around the world. Uh, people look at things with a bias and that bias is based on their own history and their own experience. When we need to be thinking, wiping the slate clean, thinking that we're in a room of whiteboards and nothing exists. One of the questions that we ask our clients when we're doing interviews, when we start our, our strategy work is we say, let's assume it didn't exist and we're building it brand new, what components would it have? And interestingly enough, they see it differently, they think of it differently, and they would build it differently. So we all have to tap in to our respective imaginations, because if we do, the entire global population can reimagine a different, better, energized, far more productive, collaborative world. Yeah, and one of the things that, you know, you talk about students and teachers, uh, and bringing in experts. The one thing that really concerns me are the people that hold uh, science as a noun and not a verb. Okay. I mean, science is action. I mean, nobody owns the science. And so, you know, we saw it in COVID. We, you know, probably also see it in climate change. You know, yeah. who owns the science? Yeah. You know, I, 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 I uh, am involved in, in a couple of companies that do some mining of, of, uh, of uh, um, uh, what do you call the rare earths, okay, metals. And, you know, everybody talks about how clean everything is, but we're exporting our pollution. You, you know, I don't know if you've seen one of these strip mines in Australia or in, in uh, Africa, uh, Chile, you know, or in Africa, you know, the amount of effort it takes to get it, refine it. By the way, they haven't figured out a way to properly dispose of it. God forbid you, you think about recycling it yet. It should, and it so... Sure, you, you've, and I'm, I want to tell you something. So my concern, uh, I bought a new car uh, in January this year, right after the holidays. And the sales manager said, so what are you thinking about? You thinking about an EV? And, and I said, you know, uh, great question. Uh, first, 
like a number of consumers, I've got range anxiety. Secondly, I care about the environment just as much as everybody else does, but there has been no end of life resolution on batteries and batteries are hazardous wastes and not disposed of properly. You're talking about groundwater contamination. Right. And uh, that's why this notion that we've got a solution in EV, well, maybe not, maybe not. That's why we've got to have whiteboards and just say, what could it be? What can it be? And, and let's allow the scientists and the engineers reimagine it and come up with a lot of exciting and, and new solutions. And, and the final thing I'll say with regard to, to any kind of transportation, at the end of the day, the marketplace should drive whatever that is. But here in the United States, you know, this is, we're a 70% consumer driven economy. Uh, and US consumers thrive on freedom of choice thrive on freedom of choice. They're going to choose what they want to buy and what they want to do. And that's just the way it's going to be. So if the government says we want this solution versus that solution, I'm not sure it's going to go well. But in the end, consumers want a reduced carbon footprint, but consumers want to own the solution. They want to be part of that solution. They want to be engaged in that conversation as well. And I'm waiting for, I'm waiting for that conversation to start, because if it does, uh, I think it can be, I think it'd be uh, incredibly positive. So one of the things I'll be writing about in my white paper is that if this fuels uh, industry ecosystem comes together, rather than coming to the federal government and the regulators and legislators, that when they put together these pre-competitive solutions in this 25 year roadmap, that they ought to go to the consumers and say, how do you feel about this? What do you think about this? Because at the end of the day, you know, there's this proclivity here in the United States that, you know, we're going to run to Washington and that's where to solve the problem. The answer is you solve your problem when you build partnerships with the American consumer because they're going to tell you what they want. Right. Um, and then you lead from there, not from Washington. Right. I agree with that 100 percent. You mentioned about, uh, you know, trades uh, advocacy and, and industry advocacy, advocacy. And we talked about science. And the one thing that really causes gives me cause for pause is when people talk, start talking about the science. Yeah. You know what I mean, it's like like as if it's unquestionable. And then you're a heretic burned at the stake yeah. if you actually do question it. And, you know, I was in school, you know, high school and college. You know, the the the, the uh, courses I took, philosophy in college, English in, in, in high school, they would say, question everything. You know what I mean? Question everything. We don't know what we don't know, you know, and what we do know or what we think we know isn't necessarily true. I mean, you know, cigarettes were good for you at one time, you know, uh, they had this whole uh, dietary pyramid, which has been turned upside down. You know, <laughs> they said you need to eat a lot of cereal. And now it's like, oh, don't eat cereal. Or don't eat grains. They, they're bad for you. And it's just like, you know, if you don't question it, you never grow right. past it. Right. All right. So, and, then, so, and then you so, wonder about the, the uh, economics involved. You know, what are the, is it, is it yeah. money motivating the outcome or is it, you know, pure? So, so first and foremost is that, um, I always viewed science as in constant motion. And that means that science evolves and science changes. And we, we should look at it that way because every bit of science has different assumptions that go into it. And we have to understand what those assumptions are because they might not be the same assumptions in the next set of science. And you're right to say we must challenge everything. We've got a responsibility as, as human beings and citizens and countries all around the planet to question and challenge. Uh, because at the end of the day, everything is gonna influence us. So it's okay to influence it. Uh, and now what I would offer to you is, is that, I, again, when I look at the demographics and at the public polling, not the political polling, there is a strong desire here in the United States uh, to reduce uh, the environmental footprint, right? We want lower CO2. Absolutely understand it. And I agree with it. But it's, again, a mistake to say we think we know the answer. 
um, the consumers want to be part of that discussion and they want to be part of that solution. So industries are spending a lot of money, making a lot of investments. The question in my mind is, will the consumers be there? I'm not convinced of that yet. There's a way to go in order to get there. Consumers, in addition to uh, wanting a lower environmental footprint, I mean, they want safety and they want convenience. The whole manner in which people think about transportation in this country is evolving. So to say we know what the answer is today is it's the, it's the equivalent to missing a bet because we don't know the answer. We don't right. know what it's going to be. Right. And I, I think that there was an art, a commercial some years ago from one of the big three or big five or however many accounting firms, consultancies there were at the time, but it was a great ad. Um, and it basically said, um, <clears throat> if you've proposed a solution I can't afford, you haven't solved my problem. You know, and that's, that's I mean, you know, people, uh, you know, talk about, you know, going out and buying a, an EV car, like, you know, everybody could just afford it. I mean, you know, with your, my gallon of milk, I'll throw it in my EV car that I just bought, you know, just a, a little bit uh, out of touch. I want to move a, a little bit off of uh, EV and stuff like that to talk about industry at large. You know, we're seeing this anxiety um, uh, between the United States and China, and China was a, a big producer of a lot of product that we consumed in the States. A lot of that is moving off to Vietnam uh, mm -hmm. and other other Cambodia. places in the Southeast, yeah, uh, in Korea and Southeast uh, Asia. Um, and then we have this border challenge. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, I look at the border and I look at Central America and I look how underserved that area is Mm -hmm. And that these people turn to, you know, drugs and violence because they have no alternative. Okay, mm -hmm. that's just, that's how they make a living down there because they have no alternative. Mm -hmm. What if instead of far shoring, we started near shoring, we, we invested in building a highway network through Guatemala to down to, to Colombia, and started, you know, and you know, the people, I'll tell you what, I've been to Mexico countless times. I have a lot of Mexican right. friends. These people right. work their asses off. I mean, they work, they work, they have a work ethic bar none. Um, and if given the opportunity and the infrastructure, why wouldn't we want to partner with them instead of, you know, locales that are further afield? So you're talking about supply chains and yeah. supply chains as a topic is highly complex. So uh, what was interesting to me during COVID, uh, people said um, it was a supply and demand problem. So the issue is supply chains have always been broken. Um, they were outmoded and we needed to reimagine and re-envision what they were going to be. Uh, and as part of that, there's the China challenge, right? So there's uh, billions and billions of dollars of intellectual property theft. Yes. Uh, and, and we're finding that the cost of exporting from China into the United States is not as cost effective as it once was. And there are national security concerns. So when you put those issues together, there's new and different thinking around reshoring and nearshoring. Reshoring is a challenge and from a, a, a standpoint that you've got to have a workforce that's skilled and trained and, and, and ready uh, to go to work in an industry. So that's first issue that needs to be addressed. The second uh, issue that needs to be addressed is, do we have the sufficient infrastructure in the United States to do what I would call an auto and an immediate reshoring? The answer is no, not really. So what I'm seeing is, is companies are doing a combination of nearshoring and reshoring. And they're doing that to uh, sort of hedge their bets. Right. Um, and where else might we build these partnerships? So reshoring, uh, challenge, but it's happening and it's happening well. Nearshoring, it's happening and uh, it's expanding. So I think that nearshoring and reshoring uh, are going to be uh, are going to be serious strategies as we go forward, without without a doubt. The other thing uh, that I'm seeing is is that. Uh, likely to be more bilateral agreements between the United States uh, and other countries. Uh, because what that does is 
So when you look at the USMCA agreement, while it wasn't a bilateral, it was sort of a trilateral agreement between the US, Canada, and Mexico, it really created a uh, dynamic by which these three countries could re rely upon each other reliably. And uh, I think, let's say the United States and, and the UK having a, a bilateral agreement, the United States and, and, and other countries having bilateral agreements, it's the ability for both countries to take direct control over what they want uh, and, and to make a win-win for both sides. Yeah, yeah. So I promised you that I was going to ask you this question earlier. Okay. Um, you know, yourself uh, and your, your firm, and I, I firmly believe in, in all my uh, executive coaching, I, I, and a lot of people at starting their own businesses, I ask this question, okay? And I believe this, you know, to the core of my heart that every person ha is a superhero. You know, mm. Batman's you know, a superhero, uh, you know, uh, Superman, Wonder yeah. Woman, they're all superheroes. And each one of these superheroes has a superpower, something that the other ones don't have. So, Dan, what's your superpower? The ability to think far beyond today. And where that comes from is as a uh, young child growing up in Queens delivering newspapers, uh, had Grandma Josephine, my mother's mother who lived with us, that while I went to school during the day, she helped me wrap newspapers when I got home from school. And that's when school started. And what I learned from her was she would say, Grandma Josephine would say, the problem is, is that people don't think big enough. They don't think different enough. And that as you go through life, the bigger you think, the more different you think, the more opportunities uh, there will be for you and for others. And I adopted that when I was 10 or 11 years old, and I haven't changed. And my su superpower is to see well beyond today, to not get caught into the drama of today's headlines or today's Twitter feed, because the world is much bigger than that. The opportunities are far greater than that. I feel blessed that I was born in the most innovative, most productive, freest economies in the world. And uh, married the love of my life and we raised our three children and now we have five grandchildren, all living in the freest, most productive, most innovative economy. It's incumbent upon us to continue to use our collective superpower to reimagine and rethink who we are. What's behind that superpower for me and what drives it is boundless energy, persistence, and determination. That's a that's a great superpower to have, you know. Um, persevere, you know, Josie Wells. Uh, Endeavor to persevere, one of the yes. greatest lines of the movie. And I think that's what we have to think about. You know, we have to think about um, not today's headlines and not tomorrow's headlines. Um, I would like to know what uh, I would like to have tomorrow's uh, uh, Wall Street Journal uh, today, you know, <laughs> you know like the one being, a week from now. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So. Um, so but, you know, we live in the here and now, but, you know, we have to plan for that future. And I think that we also have to make sure that we approach it in an agile fashion. Yes. If we get too, you know, fix it. Yeah too fixed in one channel, too dedicated to one channel, we're not going to be able to be nimble and agile enough to, to, uh, you know, change direction uh, when the, when the winds change. So it's tough. So one of my closing thoughts, Joe, is that we need to be focused on a constant evolution, not a revolution. If we're Amen. evolutionary, we will be agile. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Dan, Hey, I want to thank you. Uh, for being on my pad podcast. It's great catching up with you after all these years. And I, I'm so now, listen, happy don't that be you're a stranger. Well. We've got it. We've got to stay in touch. Oh, absolutely. Well, you know, I got things going on in uh, DC there. So I'll make sure that I'll give, give absolutely. you a call when I'm in town. Please do. Thank you for listening to State of Readiness. You can discover more episodes and learn about the book written by Joseph Paris of the same title at www.state-of-readiness.com. You can learn more about Joseph Paris at www.josephparis.me/card.